This is going to be, this, this session is called Consumer Christianity, and it's a really important subject. It's a very important message, I believe, it's a, to, to, for, for the American church, for us in the American church. And Paul, in Ephesians chapter 1, we've been looking at this for several weeks as we've studied the ecclesia and what God has intended the church to be. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, Paul said he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as the head over all things to the church. And we've been drilling this concept into our heads. The church is not a place you go on Sunday. The church is not a two-hour service we attend once a week. The church is not a building. The church is is the, look what Paul says, verse 27, it is the very body of Jesus Christ, the fullness of him who fills all in all. What, what a transition, how hard it is to break out of the mentality that church is a place you go, that church is a building, that church is a service. To see that church is the very body of Jesus Christ. It is the very body who has his indwelling life in them. So we are a new creation, not just individually. We are not just an individual new creation, but we are that. The church, the ecclesia, the corporate is a new creation. It's something that's never, ever been done in history. The ecclesia is the very body of Jesus Christ. Jesus expresses his life through the body on earth. That is who you are. What an amazing concept. What an amazing insight that Paul gives us. Church is not where you go. Church is not a building. Church is not a service. We are the individual members of Christ's body having the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. Now let's turn to 1 Corinthians 14, 26. And we've been talking about a body functioning in divine order for, for many weeks. But in 1 Corinthians 14, 26, Paul is going to give us insight into what the first century church looked like. When the first century church gathered together, what did that look like? And Paul's telling us, what is the outcome then, brethren, when you assemble? In other words, when the individual members of the body of Christ gather together and assemble, this is what Paul is saying it is to look like. Each one has a psalm. Each one has a teaching. Each one has a revelation. Each one has a tongue. Each one has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. So we get a very different concept of what church in the first century looked like compared to what the church in the 21st century looks like. I mean, it's vastly different. Francis Chan, if you've ever listened to him, he always, not always, but frequently asked the question, if you were stranded on a deserted island and all you had was a Bible and you were given the assignment to come up with a church that you are to plant, what would that look like? If you had no other cult cultural influences or personal biases or any other input, what would that look like? The one thing I can assure you is that we would never come away and walk away with a building a church that was characterized mostly by a two-hour service led by only one pastor and a worship team. We would not walk away with a, a church characterized by consumers who pay their tithe in exchange. Now, I'm not saying don't pay your tithe, obviously. To consumers who pay their tithe in exchange for a quality, eloquent message that makes you feel good and to an, an anointed, excellent performance by a worship band. You would not build a church where the entire dependence on meeting with God relied upon a pastor and a worship team. You would not build this well-oiled functional machine that operated by the creativity and the human wisdom 
and the talents and skills and the gifts of men that if the Holy Spirit doesn't even show up, no one even notices. You wouldn't build a leadership hierarchy where there's one leader who sits at the chop, top and he gives chain of command orders to those under him. You would not build what we see in so many churches, an organization built on org charts and organizational models and running more like an American corporation than the body of Jesus Christ. See, most likely, if you were to go on a deserted island with you and your Bible and the Holy Spirit with the assignment to plant a church, you would build something that was a much more like this, that was utterly and completely God-centered. It's not for us. The church is not about us. This idea that we're going to build a seeker-sensitive church with God being relegated outside the door is absolutely unscriptural. In fact, Jesus said to the church in Laodicea, I stand outside the door and I knock. What a rebuke. Man. I mean, can you imagine if the Lord said that to us? But I believe he would say it to many churches in America I'm so glad you're seeker-sensitive, but listen, I'm outside the door knocking to come in. You become so consumed and preoccupied with being focused on what other people think and being so sensitive to what other people think that I, by the way, it is my church, I am outside the door knocking to come in. What a rebuke. God help us never to be rebuked that way by Jesus himself. I believe that would be the Lord's word to much of the American church. Is you've got a great thing going, you think, in your own eyes. It's bringing in money. It's bringing in crowds. It's bringing in all this stuff and activity. The problem is I'm outside of the church knocking to come in. God help us never to be like that. We would build a church that's God-centered and people-oriented. It's not building-oriented. It's based on deep personal relationships that are forged by the Holy Spirit. It's beautiful. It's beautiful what God wants to build. The very fellowship that the Godhead enjoyed in eternity past, where the Father and the Son shared in deep intimacy and enjoyment of each other. The very eternal purpose of the Godhead was to invite a creation into the very fellowship that they enjoyed for all eternity. That is amazing. And the church is to be the community of people who enjoy that fellowship. What, I mean, what an incredible invitation. And that fellowship is not just to be between us and the Lord. It's to be between us and one another as well. The fellowship of the church. I mean, the church is built on Holy Spirit forged relationships. Koinonia fellowship. The fellowship that comes out of the Spirit. The fellowship that comes out of this Trinity, this Godhead community of enjoying God, flowing into the individual members and us enjoying God together and each other as well. That is what this whole thing's about. It's not about a building. It's not about a service. It's about relationships forged by the Spirit of God as we together are in pursuit of the man, Jesus Christ. See, you would build something where when we gathered together, it was a gathering of those who have the indwelling life of Jesus Christ, where we are gathering just like we did today in our worship time. We gathered under the head of Jesus Christ. It was beautiful today. Exalting Jesus Christ. You, that last song, you just felt like every other name is coming down except the name of Jesus Christ. Praise God for that. That there will be no other name named except his name. And that everything of man, everything of Babylon is coming crashing down we gathered under the headship of Jesus Christ as his body, and his body began to work. One had a prophecy, one had uh, a song, one had uh, you know, an exhortation. And so we just see the Lord just moving beautifully through his body, just like 1 Corinthians 14, 26 says. See, we would have, you would build a church as an interdependent body of individuals. 
Now here's this. This is where we need to get. Who've taken ownership and responsibility for the weekly gathering. You wouldn't say we're just consumers who are just going to come to church to consume me the message and consume the music and go home and leave. You, just like Paul said, there is an ownership and a responsibility for the individual members when we gather. See, you, you would build a church that would learn how to flow together as a body interdependently in divine order. See, you would build a church that would be equipped to experience God independently, but also realize their utter dependence upon one another for life and growth. See, you would build this church that was so utterly dependent on the Holy Spirit that if the Holy Spirit did not show up, you would go home early because you have nothing to give. There's no value in human creativity, in human wisdom apart from the Spirit of God. It doesn't bring life. It just puffs up the soul. It doesn't mean God doesn't use creativity and wisdom. He does. But under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you would build a church so utterly dependent on Him that apart from Him, we could do nothing. See, you would build a community that's held together by deep relationships and bonds of love and trust and care for one another that function like a healthy family. See, what has happened in the American church is basically we've become copycats of the church down the street, of the church down the street, of the church down the street, instead of modeling what God has intended in the New Testament. See, as I, I've been studying the life of Paul recently, and one of the things that has stood out to me in the life of Paul is Paul's, one of Paul's greatest challenges in his apostolic ministry was confronting those who had been under the law of Moses for 1,300 years. I mean, 1,300 years, a nation who was seeking God, even, an, even a nation, even the, the law given 1,300 years when Paul was on the scene, 613 commandments in five books of the Bible called the Torah, the entire culture of Israel had been shaped and formed by these 16, 613 commandments, and Paul was trying to bring a community out of, uh, from being under the heavy burden of the law into this place where they had the life of the Spirit of God, and they lived by the life of the Spirit of God, and they functioned together as one interdependent body. And Paul's constant challenge to the people were, you have got to come out of the law. Paul would say things like, the law is a tool of condemnation and death. If you're trying to be justified by the law, you've been severed from the very grace of Jesus Christ. I mean, think about the radical statements of Paul. And we look at that now and go, yeah, that's exactly right. But, I mean... The radical confrontation the Apostle Paul had to those who were, wanting to, who were wanting to come back under the law. In fact, there were Judaizers who believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but they still believed that Gentiles needed to obey the law of Moses. And so Paul was confronting that. Conf I mean, always in his epistles, Basically saying, if, if you are living by the law, you're under a curse. If you're trying to be justified from the law, you've been severed from Christ. And, and saying radical statements that we are no longer under the law, we're under grace. If you're led by the Spirit of God, you're not under the law. I mean, just incredibly radical statements for that hour he lived in. And we don't think about how challenging that was, but the entire culture of Israel, the entire Anyone who wanted to get draw near to the one true God had to go through Israel, had to join themselves to the Lord and come under the 16 and 613 commandments of the Torah. Now, I believe in our day, there's many challenges in our day. I believe one of the greatest challenges to, for God's eternal purpose to be realized in the church is what has come since Constantine in 325 A.D. 
See, Paul had 1,300 years of the law being preached in a culture he had to establish so he could have a community of people who learned to live by the Spirit of God and learned to live by the Spirit of God together in community as one body. But now in our day, what we're, what we're challenged with is not so much, I mean, you see in, some, in the Messianic movement maybe, but not so much in a real prominent way, you don't see people wanting to come under the law. Now, I know there is a segment where there's, that's growing some, but I believe one of the greatest challenges that we face today is we now have 1,700 years of what church looks like being a consumer model where you go to a building, you go to a service, and you, you know, hear a message and you go home, and that really does not much in terms of transformation. And God has to sometimes bring the hammer down to smash down that old wineskin of what has been passed down to us so that God can get what he wants. So that God can get what he desires, which is a body filled with the life of Jesus Christ, learning how to live by divine life, learning how to express the divine life of Jesus Christ, and learning how to express that together as a community of believers knit together by the Spirit of God. And that, that concept that we're so ingrained into our culture, it is so ingrained into our culture. I mean, we just always ask, where do you go to church? I mean, I, I, I struggle with that even. I'm preaching these, this series of messages. I'm like, where does he go to church? I'm like, okay, okay. That's not right. You know, I'm not trying to, like, be, you know, religious about it but I mean you know it's so hard to say okay where does he go to church and then what we do is we 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 judge that church oh that's this kind of church that's that kind of church and then we put the people we're talking to in a box of who they are based upon where they quote unquote go to church I mean how am I the only one that does that <laughs> yeah Dad, why don't you come preach this? So, I do that. We all do that. We say, where do you go to church? And then we, we put them into a box and we judge them and we assess them based upon where they go to church. That is completely unscriptural. You don't, you don't go to church. You're either part of the church of Jesus Christ or you're not. The question would be, where do you gather as a church? No, I don't mean you have to go and start. Just, just think through that. It's a, it's a different rewiring of our, of our minds. I mean, it is a total rewiring of the way we think, isn't it? I mean, it, it really it, it, it causes us to think, okay, this is so different. Francis Chan, in his book, The Letter, Letters to the Church, Letters to the Church, he was telling a couple stories that really impacted me. It's an excellent book if you've, ever, if you've never read it. I, I highly recommend that book, Letters to the Church. But he was telling a story when he was gathering together with some Chinese pastors, and they were talking about the move of the Holy Spirit that had taken place in China. And there came a point in the government when the persecution of the Chinese believers eased off some. And the Chinese pastor said, you know what, we're going to start gathering together and doing services like they do in America. Meaning we're going to, instead of meeting underground, instead of meeting as a body, we're going to start having a two-hour service on a Sunday like they do in America. And Francis Chan was saying, okay, at first they were saying it was great. They, you know, at first they were like everyone was alive and people were you know, excited about it and all this stuff. He said, but you know what, the, the pastors were so discouraged and they were wanting to have the old days back, he said, because what happened was the church became a consumer. And they stopped making disciples. And they stopped expressing the life of Jesus Christ together. And they began to come, like we see in America, to church to be fed by the pastor. Instead of learning how to commune with Jesus Christ, and express his life together as a body. And the pastors were or the pastors were discouraged about that because they began to want a Jesus and a church that served their needs and kept them comfortable. 
Sounds like America, doesn't it? Francis Chan wrote, he said, what started as a movement became a bunch of people sitting safely in services. He told another story where him and his daughter, they went to an underground church somewhere in China, and he was just watching these young people pray, God, send us to the most difficult places. Lord, send us out to evangelize. Send us out no matter the cost, no matter the price. We want to go to the, you know, whatever you will send us. It doesn't matter if we die for you. Lord, send us out. And he was watching them and listening to them pray and just was like so taken back by the abandoned passion of this local, this local gathering. And he started asking them all this, these questions. And, and they're like, okay, why are you asking us all these questions? And Francis Chan wrote, he said, well, listen, in America, what we do is we gather for one, an hour and a half service, 90 minute service every week where someone comes and brings a message and, and we call it church and we think, okay, and what the people do, they're, if they don't like the preaching or if they don't like the message or they don't like the music or the kids ministry or whatever, they just go to the church down the street and change churches at will. And as he was talking, the people just started laughing. Not just little chuckles here and there, but they were laughing hysterically to the point Francis said, I felt like I was a comedian. I mean, that is, you know, the church in China is probably the closest example of what the New Testament church is to be like. And they were looking at the American church laughing at us. See, we have so drifted from what the scriptures say the church is to be into a consumer model that's driven by what the customer wants. This is what I want. My felt needs are this, this, and that. And so the church and its leadership has now developed this model. We're going to meet the felt needs of our consumers so they will keep coming back and pay the money and you know, eventually have a relationship with Jesus. It's so backwards. And I believe God would want to get us back to the, his original intention for the church. Now, let's look on page two here in our notes. I want to just for a second compare consumer Christianity with what Paul wrote about the body of Christ. See, the paradigm, the way we view it, the way we view church... The paradigm, the lens through which we see it, is vastly different than what Paul wrote about. See, consumer Christianity views church as a place you go on Sunday. Paul wrote in the New Testament church, the body of Christ views church as a people who regularly gather together under the headship of Jesus Christ, where we wait on him and learn to express his life together. See, consumer Christianity pays tithes in exchange for a quality two-hour service with music and a message. But the body of Christ is meant to be active participators. I don't think you heard that. Active participators. We are not to be spectators in the Sunday gathering or whenever we gather together. It is the body flowing together. We've, we've taken ownership and responsibility for the gathering. Here's the big one right here. Consumer Christianity doesn't even think about the Sunday gathering until we're 15 minutes into worship. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if that applies to you because everyone who raised their hand I already know the answer. 15 minutes into worship, we go, oh, yeah, 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 we're at church. The body of Christ takes ownership and responsibility to seek the Lord for a word throughout the week, a teaching, a song, a scripture that would help give expression of Christ indwelling life that would help build up the body. I won't ask how many people did that this week. Maybe I will. No, I'm, I'm in a good mood. So, Consumer Christianity is pastor dependent. Worship team dependent. The body of Christ is equipped to experience God individually 
but also realizes the need for interdependence for life and growth. Consumer Christianity is spectator Christianity where we come to be spiritually entertained. We come to hear a message and feel good. The body of Christ is one who is an owner who takes responsibility to do their part so the body of Christ can mature and grow up. I mean, isn't that vastly different? Isn't the New Testament church vastly different than the American church? I mean, even here where we've come out of so much, I mean, don't we fall back into that cultural definition of what church looks like in America so easily? God wants to break that wineskin. God wants to shatter that wineskin. God wants to take his hammer out and smash to pieces this old American wineskin that's been in, the, in place for 1,700 years. God wants to smash it to give expression to the body of Christ on the earth. Now I say let him do it. God's way is so much better than what human wisdom can give us and what human wisdom has given us. Now let's turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We want to look at here four signs of consumer Christianity. Four signs of consumer Christianity. The first one is this, is we decide where we go to church... And we decide when we leave a church. I don't see that in Scripture. I'm, if, you, if it is there, show me. I don't see one Scripture that says, you pick where you want to go to church. I don't see one scripture like we've come to America where now we're like, okay, if someone's picking a church, it's almost like house hunters. Have you ever seen that show where we want a four-bedroom house with two and a half baths and two garage with a big basement and a garage? And, you know, they pick churches like as if they're picking a house, you know. I don't see that in scripture. Here's what I see in the scriptures is I see what Paul said, but now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. What I see is not our own choice and our own, our own consumer mentality. What's going to be best for me and my kids? What I see is the Lord saying that we will place, this is a lordship issue, I'm going to place you in my body just as I desire. When I read this, it, 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 that we don't really get the choice of where we go to church or, you know, not even who, who we gather with under the headship of Jesus Christ. We don't really get that choice. It's a lordship issue. It's not a consumer issue of like, well, a five-star rating for the message, three-star rating for the ministry, the kids' ministry, whatever, five-star rating for the worship, whatever. And, you know, this is where I think God's called me to No, that's not where God's called you to go. You're, you're operating on a consumer American mindset. See, I believe that the, church, the most important decision or one of the most important decisions you will ever make, and it rate, rates, ranks right up there with who you'll marry, what job you will take, where you're going to live, where, what house you're going to live in, I believe the most important, one of the most important decisions you will ever make is, Lord, what body should I gather with? I, I, I believe that with all of my heart. It's a lordship issue. The Lord has placed into his body the members what as he desired. As he desired. I just see this in America, and it's just grieving. What about seeking God 
and saying, Lord, I am your servant. You are my Lord. Where do you want to place me into your body? <laughs> Number two is we depend upon a leader for spiritual growth. <laughs> Show me in Scripture where it says, you are dependent upon your leader to come to Jesus Christ. I've heard this, you know, pastors, you know, we, you know, pastors, I hear it all, you know, different pastors have heard it all the time in ministry is, well, I'm not just, be, I'm not being fed here anymore. I'm not, I'm not growing anymore. Well, I don't really see in scripture where, you know, there is a place where the shepherds feed the sheep for sure, but I don't really see in Scripture where it says the pat you're supposed to be dependent on a spiritual leader for growth. I mean, if you can find that in the Scripture, show me. But what I see in this, what I see, is that we each are priests to God. The very truth that was restored in the Reformation of the priesthood of the believer is that every believer has direct access to God. We don't have to go through a leader to get to the Lord. I mean, you would be amazed when we teach learning to hear God's voice in Africa. One of the most, probably the most, uh, the most feedback we've gotten, or one of the most things of feedback we've gotten, is everyone there, or so many people there, are stunned when they realize, I, I mean, you're telling me I don't have to go through this pastor to hear God's voice? That's probably the num one of the number one responses we get, is, is I always thought I had to go through this pastor to hear from God. No, you have direct access to the Lord. So there, the only reason you haven't been fed is because you haven't taken the Scriptures and the Spirit of God and gone alone with the Lord Himself to be fed. See, it's not a pastor's responsibility to, to strictly feed you. Now, there is a place where shepherds are to feed the sheep, for sure. But we also have a responsibility for our own growth by our own relationship with Jesus Christ. So you're never going to be able to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and if you're in an immature state and say to the Lord, well, I just wasn't being fed by my pastor. That's not going to cut it. The Lord would say, you didn't take responsibility to grow and to know me yourself. You are as close to God as you want to be. If you're not growing, if you're not drawing near to the Lord, if you're not getting closer to Him, it is not your pastor's fault. And I'm not, I'm not saying like someone came, some, probably like someone complained to you recently. No, I'm just making a point. I'm just wanting us to get off this dependency upon a leader kind of paradigm that we have to go through a leader to get to God. No, you have direct access to God. You can hear the Lord yourself without having to come to a pastor. Kind of quiet, so. Number three. This one will get us, I'm sure is if we are a consumer Christian, one sign of it is we don't take responsibility for the weekly gathering. Now, that's, that's up to the pastor. That's up to the worship team. See, how much time this week did you seek the Lord, did you spend seeking the Lord, asking Him, Lord, what do you want to say? What do you want to do? What do you want me to bring for Sunday? How much time did you spend? I won't ask that too long because you'll start feeling bad. But the truth is, we don't even think about Sunday service until we're 15 minutes into worshiping him. We're like, oh. But Paul is exhorting us, when you assemble, the responsibility is on you as a member of his body. The sole responsibility does not lie with the pastor and the worship team. See, we have 
I want, this is what I want to drill into us. As the body, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility. There is to be ownership. See, what God wants to do, He wants to do corporately. What God wants to do, He wants to do not just through one or two individuals who are anointed. The coming end time move of the Holy Spirit is going to come through the body, not just through one or two anointed vessels. It's coming through the body of Jesus Christ. That means we need to take a shift and move away from a consumer mentality and take ownership and responsibility for when we gather. I mentioned this when we were talking about the, the, our, the worship wineskin, is that the Ark of the Covenant, when, when David wanted to bring the Ark of the Covenant from Zion, or to Zion, he tried to bring it on a new cart, and Uzzah touched it, and he died immediately. And, you know, it's just like David's like, what? That's crazy. He just was trying to study it. And David sought the Lord about it, and he realized, oh, you know what? I was trying to bring the glory of God in on, by a new method and a new way. Instead of allowing the glory of God to come in on the shoulders of the priest. Well, the Ark of the Covenant weighed, I think it was between 330 to 615 pounds. That means between 85 to 160 pounds rested upon each of the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, can you imagine the weight and the burden it took to be a priest who carried the Ark of God to Zion? But see, that is the way that the glory of God comes in the church. It doesn't come by one pastor, one worship team. It comes by the priesthood of every believer carrying their role and their responsibility. See, think about this for a second. If, if you know, there were, there, there were three priests on each side carrying the, the, the ark on the, with poles on their shoulders, if one of the priests said, you know, I'm just not going to come this Sunday, or I'm not going to be associated with the body locally. I'm not going to take my responsibility as an individual member in the body. And I don't really feel like going today. Think about that. What would happen in David's context? Well, the Ark of the Covenant would have fallen onto the ground. You see what I'm saying? The, the responsibility we have as a body when we gather is not just to be spectators. It's not just to come and listen. It's not just to come and be spiritually entertained, we have the responsibility to carry the Ark of the Covenant together as a corporate body so the glory of God can come into the service. Now, I, I think we did that pretty, pretty well today. I feel, really felt God move today. But, you know, as priests, we can't just live any old life. You are a priest. You are to be consecrated. You are to be set apart. You are to be set apart for the Lord. That means your, your walk is narrow, your path is narrow. You just can't decide, well, I'm just going to not come today, or I don't really feel that great, you know, I'm, I'm just going to not come. I mean, you know, we have a responsibility. Angie woke up today with a migraine, and so, you know, she's just, you know, last thing in the world she wants to do is probably be at church. But she's taking her responsibility, and she's back there teaching. You know, you can't just wake up one, you know, in the morning, ah, I think I'm going to not go today. You're being irresponsible. Amen, I will. Now, there's times when we, you know, have vacations, and God blesses that. But I, over the years, I've just have seen, you know, well, some people, I don't really feel like going today. It doesn't matter how you feel. Since when in the scriptures are we to be led by our feelings and how we feel? I read in the scriptures, be led by the Holy Spirit. Say, I mean, I'm biting off a bad headache right now as I'm preaching. I'm probably giving you a headache as I'm preaching. 
I don't really feel like doing this right now because my head's killing me. I didn't sleep good last night. And it wasn't because I stayed up watching football because I didn't watch football. I'm on a fast. I just, you know, couldn't sleep very good last night. See, God never said, if you feel like it, gather together with the local ecclesia. If you don't feel like it, then just seek me in the prayer closet. I say it over and over and over again. If you are not connected to a local church, you can never, ever fulfill God's eternal purpose. You can never fulfill God's eternal purpose locked away in your own prayer closet with you and Jesus. Show me one place in Scripture where you see that. No, you don't see that. You see the the writer of Hebrews saying, don't forsake the assembling together with Christ's body. I don't know where we got this idea that we can just You know, if I feel like it, I'll join a local church. If I feel like it, I'll come to church. If I feel like it, I'll connect in with the body. But if I don't feel like it, I won't. You'll never fulfill God's eternal purpose. You'll never come into God's ultimate intention as a Lone Ranger Christian with you and Jesus in your prayer closet. What God is doing in these days and in this time, He's doing corporately, not individually. That doesn't mean... We're not to have our individual relationship with Jesus. We are to have our individual relationship with Jesus, but we can never, ever see God's ultimate intention fulfilled on our own. It's corporately, and what God is doing in the last days, He's going to do corporately. Anyone want an aspirin from... See, sometimes we schedule activities and we schedule events and all these different things. Now, again, I'm not saying we never, ever do that. But ask the Lord, Lord, are you giving me permission not to come today? And if he says yes, let me know, because I would like to have a conversation with him. (laughs) See, we're not just the typical community church where if you don't, you know, if you miss a Sunday not that big a deal because, you know, you basically, same salvation message week after week after week. I mean, God does, if you haven't really realized this, God does something new every single Sunday. God is saying something different every single Sunday. The Lord is speaking every single time. And if we miss that, we can miss the Lord. And again, that's not putting us into bondage. You can never, ever miss a Sunday. Speaking of football, before I, got off, before I got onto my football fast, if anyone was watching the Georgia-Notre Dame game, there came this time when Georgia was moving really fast down the field, and Notre Dame started faking injuries. I don't know if you saw that, but there was one particular scene where one of the players, you could see one of the players pushed down the other player onto the ground, and he faked an injury, and he went all throughout social media saying, oh, yeah, Notre Dame was faking injuries so they, could, they were getting too tired to stop Georgia. But and I was thinking about that. I think, I think sometimes people in the church are like Notre Dame football players. We're faking our injuries, you know? And we wake up with a little sniffle, and we eh, I got a cold. I can't come today. Oh, my ankle hurts. I can't really walk, or whatever it would be. We start faking our Notre Dame injuries, <laughs> don't we? You should, you, should go, you should Google that. It's pretty funny. I mean, watching the game, one of the players got right up next to the quarterback, Georgia's quarterback's elbow and, you know, brushed it and fell right down. And the announcer said, wow, I didn't know uh, Jake Fromm's elbow was so rough. You know, it was just it was hysterical seeing it. But, you know, I think in the church we just come up with so many excuses. What I'm trying to say is that's a consumer mentality. Now, that does not mean, please, if you're sick, throwing up, and a cold, please stay home. We do not want to get your germs at church. We don't want your germs. So if you're, if you're legitimately sick and you're not faking an injury, come, all right? But what I'm trying to drill in to us is the ownership, the responsibility of our gathering, of our moving, of what God wants to do as, a, as the body of Jesus Christ. That's not solely dependent upon a spiritual leader or a worship team. God wants to move through all of us. 
Number four is we, if you're a consumer Christian, you don't take responsibility for the God-given mission of the local church. Consumer Christians don't take responsibility for the God-given mission of the local church. See, here at our church, at Restoration Life, our mission is to see God's eternal purpose fulfilled. If you still don't know what God's eternal purpose is, you can read my book. It's in the bookstore, The Eternal Blueprint. We exist to see God's eternal purpose fulfilled. So, for the church to be, for, for this eternal purpose to be fulfilled, the church has to be made ready. And the scripture verse that has driven this ministry for 20 plus years is Luke 117. John the Baptist anointed as a forerunner in the spirit and in the power of Elijah to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That's our mission. That is the mission of Restoration Life. That is why we exist. If we're not fulfilling that mission, shut the doors down. We have no purpose. We're driven by God's eternal purpose. We're driven to see God's eternal purpose fulfilled in the nations before Jesus comes back, that he would have a bride who is made ready, that he would have a corporate man, a corporate son who has been conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. See, God does not want that mission to rely solely upon the shoulders of the leadership. The Lord wants you, as a member of the local body, to take that mission to heart yourself so that you help see that mission accomplished. You see it accomplished locally. You see it accomplished in the community. You see it accomplished in the nation. See, you see what I'm saying? That the, the, the difference of thinking is it, the consumer says, I'm going to go to church for a service. The member of the body of Christ says, I am an owner and I am responsible to help see God's mission for this local gathering of Jesus Christ to be fulfilled in the city and in the nations of the earth. See, one of the things that we've developed is a model based from the Church of Antioch where we have five components of our, our local mission base, which you know we have come to call an apostolic mission base. It's like the Church of Antioch. We have a local church, a prayer center, teaching center, a ministry center, a mission center. And you know the Lord wants us to fully carry the weight of that responsibility. Yesterday morning, I had an experience where I was, in, I was sleeping, and I just woke up. And, you know, last night I had an experience where demons were keeping me awake. It wasn't football. De you know, I could just feel the oppression. <laughs> you know, just Paul talked about sleepless nights. But the night, the morning before, I felt the stirring of the Holy Spirit come upon me at about five in the morning, and I was, you know, to be honest, I was thinking, okay, this will be the this will be the morning I get to sleep in, and the Lord's like, <laughs> good try, Busty, Butter, uh, bu but good try, Buddy, yeah, I'm like, Busty, Buddy, what? <sighs> yeah, that's what happens when you don't get much sleep the night before. You start, you don't even make sense. So ho hopefully, I haven't. Hopefully my whole message has made some sense and it's not just sleep deprived. But the Lord's like, yeah, I'm, I'm here, Brian. And I, I mean, I'm, he didn't actually say this. I'm just paraphrasing what I was experiencing, what I thought. Five in the morning, out of the clear blue, I just feel the burden of the Lord come on me. And, and it, it was like, the Lord was almost like what Dad was prophesying today, and, and I didn't. I wasn't really sure. You know, you, you wake up and you're like, okay, I, I feel the Lord's burden. Okay, Lord, what what exactly is on your heart for us, or what exactly are you saying? So I, I had to wake up, had to get out of bed, 
And so I just was in prayer, just praying and asking the Lord, okay, what is it you're speaking? What is it you're saying? And here's what I felt like the Lord was speaking to us. Is the Lord wants us to shift away from this consumer mentality of church where we hear a message about God's, for example, we hear a message about God's eternal purpose and then we forget about it after our nap. He wants us to move into a corporate body who together knows, owns, lives, proclaims, and multiplies the truth of God's eternal purpose. This is a revelation. See, see the, the consumer thinks, okay, Ken and Brian got this revelation about God's eternal purpose. I'm going to hear it. Oh, that's a great message. I wholeheartedly agree with that message. That is, that's great. I love that message. It's awesome. That's the consumer. You know, some consumers probably who are not here anymore said, I don't like that, and they're gone. But when we are part of the body, when we've taken ownership and responsibility, we don't just say, that's a great message. We say, the revelation they are operating from, the, the insight, the understanding they have, I need to take that, and I need to get it here. A consumer is okay having the information here. One who's taken ownership says, I need the revelation here. There is a world of difference between the head and the heart. And so the burden I woke up with was, was that we are now, you know, 2019 for us has been a year of transition where we are transitioning from blueprint mode. We were for two years in blueprint mode where the Lord was giving us revelation of God's eternal purpose, all that it entails. We spent, you know, probably about two years speaking about that. In 2019, we began to shift into building mode. And the feeling I got is, as 2019 comes to a close, I just felt like the Lord is now giving us a final window of opportunity to really understand God's eternal purpose, to really get it into our heart. Now, I know we've heard this over and over from us, but what I found is revelation comes progressively. You know, we think we got a revelation of it. We think we've got it in our head. But the Lord's like, yeah, you don't really got it in your heart yet. It doesn't move you yet. It doesn't, it doesn't shape you. It, you, haven't, you haven't owned it. You don't live by it. You, you are not proclaiming it. And, you know, just quite simply, if someone asks you, hey, you know, what, what is your, what's the mission of your church? I ought to see God's eternal purpose fulfilled. What's God's eternal purpose? I mean, honestly, could you in like 60 seconds give an articulate answer of what God's eternal purpose is? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because, I'm again, I don't want my headache to increase. I'm kidding. But honestly, could you, do you, do you have it so in your heart God's eternal purpose, the revelation of God's eternal purpose, the understanding of God's eternal purpose. Do you have it in your heart so that you could give an articulate 60-second answer to someone who asks, okay, what is your church about? Could, could you do that? I mean, if you could, then maybe you don't need this window of opportunity the Lord's given us. I know some probably could. But the burden I woke up with is that, that the Lord wants every one of us to have that revelation of God's eternal purpose. And so the, the, the feeling I got from the Lord, the, the sense, and you, you judge this for yourself. You know, we're, we're instructed to judge prophecy. You judge this for yourself. The feeling, the, the sense I got from the Lord, the burden I got from the Lord was we were to take the next from now until the end of the year as we close fully the, season, the, the blueprint mode of this season, as we, close, as we close that, to really solidify God's eternal purpose in our heart. Because the Lord wants us to be builders. In 2020, I believe, as we move to a new building, as we shift into that, as, 
as, as, the, as we release as an apostolic mission base God's eternal purpose into Africa in 2020, as we release that more fully, I believe the Lord is wanting us to be, every one of us to be, to shift into building mode, to be wise master builders. I mean, think about it. I mean, just think about like Habitat for Humanity, where they build these houses and everyone builds the house. I mean, that's kind of like the way we are to be building the house of the Lord. I mean, can you imagine if we're all trying to build the house of the Lord and we don't really fully understand the blueprint by which we are to build? What it would look like, it would look like as if I tried to build a house by myself. I mean, it would be a complete wreck. And so I believe the Lord is opening for these last few months of 2019 a window of opportunity for us to really get God's eternal purpose in our heart. So the, 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 I believe that's the, the transition God wants to bring. Now, again, I want to say, you know, we've got a lot of, and I, I'm going to email this out, but there's a lot of tools, a lot of resources we, we can get, but I just want to encourage us to, and even exhort us in the Lord to take our responsibility to get this into our heart. You know, one resource, the, you could read my book, The Eternal Blueprint. If you haven't read that yet, that's one, one resource. Another thing that might be helpful that I'm going to start next week is I'm going to take the Eternal Blueprint book and I'm going to do an audio version of it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do an, like a, you know, an audible where they read the book verbatim. I'm not going to do that. Um, I would fall asleep doing that. But I'm going, to, I'm going to go through each chapter from my perspective and kind of do a hybrid form of teaching audible type thing where I get the Eternal Blueprint book on audio. Because I know some people, you know, they, they have an hour commute one way, an hour commute another way. I think that would be really helpful just to be able to hear it you know, where you may not have the time to read the book, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that so you, you get that in there. there. I'll send out an email of all the other resources. But, you know, it, it's so important that we get that, that message. Uh, like I think Dad prophesied this this morning, firmly established in our heart. In fact, in the notes, I think I wrote that. Uh, the last bullet point, on, or the second to last bullet point on, on page four, Dad prophesied that this morning. I don't know if he used the exact words, but he used very similar phrasing. Um, is a, the second to last bullet point, it's important before we move into a new building that we firmly establish the revelation of God's eternal purpose in our hearts. I want to I stress firmly that, it, that it's firm. We're not shaken by it. We're not moved by it. We have it so deep inside of us that it's not in, in our head. It's in our heart. Huge difference. And that we don't just have information of it. We have revelation of it. See, because what the Lord wants to do corporately through us as a local apostolic mission base He's going to launch this out into 2020 into East Africa as, this, as the Eternal Blueprint book goes throughout the East Africa. I believe he's going to open more doors for us. But the burden I got yesterday, and when, when I had that burden, I, I was not even, you know, sometimes you go to bed and you're thinking about something, you have a dream about it that night, and you wake up with it on your mind. When I went to sleep that night, that's the last thing I was even thinking about. I mean, I wasn't even, even anywhere on my mind. But I woke up with that burden. You know, I think, I think it's, it's really, really important to the Lord that there's not a gap between what we teach in the nations and who we are locally. I, I really, you know, if, if there's anything the Lord would say, I have this against you, just like he did to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, I, I believe that's the one thing the Lord would say to us is he would say that, and we've, I've stressed this for years, is, is you cannot 
and, and I would start with myself, is you cannot be teaching this, these things in the nations and yet locally, corporately, be a gap between what you're teaching and who you are locally. Now, I do believe, I really do believe that gap has been significantly closed. I mean, and I, I really do believe in, in the Lord, that gap has been significantly closed over the years. Praise God. Praise God for that, for that happening. Um, but I still believe that there's still, the Lord would, would, would encourage us gently as a shepherd to, to know our responsibility. I mean, we're, we are responsible right now for equipping over 4,000 pastors, equip, you know, helping 4,000 churches. And, when, and I'm, I'm putting the cumulative number together over the years to get trained and equipped in East Africa. I mean, in all reality, I mean, just think about this. I mean, we didn't plant those churches, but we strengthened those churches. I mean, that might be more than, that's probably more than Paul planted. Have you ever thought about that? I don't know the number, but I don't, I don't think Paul planted 4,000. We didn't plant those churches, but we were, were strengthening over 4,000 churches. I'm, I'm not equating us to Paul by any means. I'm just saying sometimes we minimize the impact of what God is doing through us. This is profound. This is profound what God's doing through us. But he wants it to be corporate, not just Ken and Brian and Randall, not just a few here and there. The Lord wants us to embody fully this revelation so that what we, we can only multiply who we are. See, when we talk about multiplication, a seed can only multiply what it is. If it's an apple tree, it's not going to multiply oranges. We're multiplying this in East Africa. We're, we're multiplying it. We're going to multiply it in the future in other places. But it's important for that seed to not just be an individual seed, but to be a corporate seed of a body of people who have owned the message together. And that so together we are one corporate body of master builders who are building the house of the Lord based on his blueprint, based on his eternal purpose, we're no longer in a consumer mentality. We are in an ownership, responsibility mentality, a body mentality for the, for the agenda of God to be fulfilled in this house. And I have, I have full confidence. I have full confidence in the Lord by the grace of God that we will do that. We will do that. We will... And we have made incredible steps. And I just want to say, let's go all the way. Let's go all the way. I mean, there's really nothing else worth living for, is there? The, the Lord, His purpose. Let's go all the way to see God's mission fulfilled. I mean, our life is a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes. Your life goes by like that, especially if you're older, you know it. If you're younger, you, you'd be wise to hear it from older people. Your life vanishes like that. The only thing that matters is the Lord and that we were faithful to his commission and his mission in this earth. So let's give ourselves wholeheartedly to seeing the mission God has given us fulfilled locally and then in the nations. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you, Lord, for your kindness. We thank you for your grace, Lord. God, we just want to honor you and bless your name, Lord. Father, I ask you right now that you would bring a, a shift in our mindset from the consumer mentality to the ownership responsibility that we have as your body. Lord, capture our hearts. Make us one body, one community, one people forged together by the Spirit of the Lord as a family, as a body who are laboring together, Lord, to see your purpose fulfilled. 
God, we pray that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, you, uh, I'm going to send out next week just some...